Thanks a lot, really, for having me here today. It's a, such a pleasure and honor um, to share space and time in this conference. Um, today, what I'll try to do is to connect attentively uh, um, some of the uh, uh, historical use of mimeograph in Italy, both from activists and uh, artists, uh, uh, especially writers, uh, and to attempt to uh, elaborate a couple of concepts that connect with uh, what we currently call post-digital. But uh, first, very quickly, th this is the magazine, actually. Let me show you. Um, that's only this issue. If you make the math, it's actually 25 years uh, now. We just celebrated 25 years of publishing. This is the magazine. You can, if you are curious, you can uh, have a look at the copy on the table. Um, it's a magazine about new media art, and we made quite a few experiments uh, with publishing, uh, uh, and especially technologies uh, that affects the printed paper, including artist intervention. And very quickly, this is the book I published in uh, 2012. Uh, has been translated variously, but is um, uh, free to download from the website postdigitalprint.org uh, and in various other websites. OK. Uh, and yeah, I'm part of the Archaeology of Media and Technology Research Group at the Winchester School of Art and the University of Southampton at the moment. But Let's start with, uh, uh, I mean, you are, you are all um, much uh, better expert than me with mimeographs. Uh, but trying to, I, I was trying in the last few days to, to pick up a few uh, important characteristics of this medium. And uh, I think that some of the unique qualities uh, as a medium of the mimeograph, uh, especially from an historical perspective, uh, um, so, there are some that actually are better defining its specific role. The, ver the first one is uh, uh, quite uh, understandably the widely acknowledged remarkable quality of being the first personal printer, which has given the mimeograph a specific historical role to reappropriate the means of print production on an almost personal level. It was affordable to small groups of people already in the mid 20th century, as we all know, and it allowed a space of thinking about personal print. I was particularly uh, liking the, the, the video before because the, uh, the, this short video was really enabling this uh, uh, imaginary about the mimeograph, the, the personal dimension of production. It's so down to the personal dimension. And this seems to have enabled, of course, as we know, its position in fostering freedom of expression, together with its ability of being easily moved, which is another crucial quality. The second quality is that the mimeograph is one of the last truly continuous uh, analog medium, compared to the discrete approach of digital, of course. Uh, I mean, th this is a usual distinction between uh, uh, analog and digital, continuous versus discrete, but it's uh, even, the, the mimeograph, I think it's even more continuous. It's the last which is truly continuous because uh, if we compare it, for example, to the photocopier, its production of stencils and ink are all but precisely divided and quantified by the machine allowing an almost unavoidable imperfection during the production. And I think this is a great quality. The third quality is exactly based on this. And this is, it, it's of being an imperfect medium, which it sounds kind of blasphemous these days. I still think it's really not. Which is clearly communicating the human labor behind it and the intrinsic limits of the machine. The resulting aesthetics is an, 
is of an ongoing light reframing of the content in a form constantly negotiated between the man and the machine. These combined characteristics will be replaced by the more precise photocopier after it, then the fax first, and then the neat screen-based media. But let's see what I think is uh, the, the most remarkable um, configuration, uh, the most remarkable concept uh, that the mimeograph enables particularly, which I try to call the trust human network. The essential nature of the mimeograph is to be social, mobile, and connective. Establishing trust human networks as an integral part of its own systems of operations. So first, it is obviously social because usually it involves more people for its whole production, so for its whole production cycle, which takes time and skills. And it surely involves more uh, people for the physical distribution of the outcomes. Second, it is mobile as its relative weight allows it to be moved from one place to the other, which reinforces its social dimension as these places should belong to trusted people, usually different from the producers. Not by accident, as you all know, the mimeograph quickly became the ideal clandestine printing device. It could be moved from place to place, avoiding confiscation and fighting censorship while producing a reasonable amount of copies. Finally, it is connective as the distribution of copies implies a physical connection between the person handling them or shipping them. And here we have the physical address, which for us means a reliable uh, thing to relate with. From uh, the person handling them and the one receiving it. The essential social role of the mimeograph is about this physical contact, in my humble opinion. To uh, give a more recent example, in the early 2000s, uh, the Italian philosopher Franco Bifo Berardi, who was one of the key figures uh, in the so-called creative autonomy, a seminal political movement in Italy in 1977, proposed a possible countermeasure against the widespread indifference towards politics. He started to distribute his own magazine about the Italian Telestreet pirate TV movement by handing out copies in the street, like political leaflets, to potentially suitable recipients. It was a gestural practice, almost performative, which created a much stronger connection between the publisher and the reader. And this gesture was composed by a combination of factors. The physical shared production, the physical contact enabled by the handling of the publication, and the acknowledged gesture where all of them were enabling an economy of trust. The space where the publisher and reader meet is a trusted one by both, and it is where the sharing of meanings happens. It was clearly, for me, recalling the publishing economy enabled by the mimeograph. Indeed, if publishing is mostly an act of mobilizing knowledge, the publishing which happens with affordable means and in, uh, in a consensual shared space allows knowledge to be even further mobilized. Let's see a few examples of the mimeograph used in Italian activism. The political use of mimeograph has peaked in Italy just before and during the Second World War, as probably has happened also in various other countries, used by opposite factions of the ongoing civil war. The anti-fascist resistance movement, so-called the Partigiani, was using it for various propaganda leaflets and publications with sensible underground organized distribution. And there are plenty 
of stories, you can also find them online, of risky moving of mimeographs during the curfew at that time from one place not anymore secure to a new better one. But it is worth to note that also the um, Instituto Nazionale di Cultura Fascista, the National Institute of Fascist Culture, used the mimeograph to com conveniently produce copies of forbidden communist ideology literature, entirely translated, typewritten, and stamped as classified, available only to its members within its walls. We have to wait until the end of 60s. Uh, we were, uh, most of the other speakers were uh, talking about this uh, 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 incredible period uh, of change of the 60s and 70s uh, to see a truly large use of mimeograph uh, when it became an iconic alternative publishing mean. This is certainly the case in the first political movements in universities uh, in 1968 but also in the subsequent one, which in Italy was even more important, in 1977. Some mimeographs were still used even in the last national uh, university movement in 1990. This is a personal note, note, because that movement in 1990 was obviously mainly led by faxes, but there were still mimeographs used, and that was my personal chance to use it actively, as I was an active part of this movement. Beyond the vast production of political magazines, and especially leaflets distributed almost every day during the squatting of universities, the mimeograph was providing the right mechanical and electric balance to provide content. And its effectiveness in producing and distributing the content relied, again, on trusted human networks. Particularly, the leaflets were politically nicknamed in Italy Fogli Volanti, which means flying sheets, enhancing how they were literally almost flying from the, the mimeograph and then flying in the hands and passing uh, uh, by different hands of those who were distributing and reading it. A separate essay would be needed to analyze the use of mimeograph by the Italian terrorist uh, groups, especially the Brigata Rossa, the Red Brigades, as their mimeograph, the press resolutions, uh, pushed everybody to understand what was going on. But their mimeographed documents were left in public places, then signaled to the major media with phone calls, uh, increasing the powerful, symbolic, and strategic meanings in this form of publishing. After a few decades, and it's curious because this procedure, I remember as a kid, was this procedure, which was a strategy, but a very, uh, uh, literally, a codified procedure, was happening every time there was a new action and the media were reporting exactly the same thing. What, what I mean is that they were reporting what happened, which was exactly the same sequence of act, acts uh, all the time. Still, uh, they were also relying on a network of trusted people in order to leave them in places where they were not seen and then making a phone call to one major newspaper who sent somebody to retrieve them and then to publish them on front page. And they become a, a really iconic medium. Uh, uh, curiously enough, after a few decades, they have become collectible, more, much more, I mean, quite like historical documents. And uh, it's uh, quite paradoxical for me that a complete collection of Red Brigade's Brigade Rossa official statesmen originals have been recently acquired by Marcello De Ruti, who is a bibliophile, Italian member of parliament, and a close colleague of Berlusconi. He, he bought them through an action 
uh, we, uh, paying a few thousand euros for only eight, the complete collection of eight of them, which are obviously the most historically important ones. And it's worth to note, uh, again, that the terrorists were counting on trusted human network, despite they were obviously, not obviously, but th th there's been quite acknowledged, uh, they, they were infiltrated by the Italian Secret Service. Uh, just a little note on it, uh, still uh, counting on mimeograph, uh, apparently the Italian Secret Service was uh, uh, conjuring to bring a the most dangerous group of uh, Red Brigades a specific mimeograph that they, they could recognize once the, 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 the leaflets were out by the type of uh, um, print that they did. So they could be sure that that print came from their own machine. There's a, quite a narrative about that, but if you're curious, I can point you to um, this specific story. And uh, looking at the police seizing reports, uh, sometimes Red Brigades were also distributing poetry, even if only the type of poetry composed in an explicit propaganda fashion. Nevertheless, the political movements in 1968 and 1977 were literally intertwined with the cultural emancipatory movements in art and literature and have inspired, offered and conjured for specific strategies of publication. So let's have a look at some of them. A few years after the 1968 movement, the Italian poet Roberto Roversi decided to cut all the relationship with publishing houses in order to set himself free from the market. He thought that the mimeograph was an exceptional mean for a change and a very innovative mean of publishing too. It allowed him to express his poetry in total independence and autonomy, choosing the mimeograph as a printer. So he wrote and laid out a few poetry books, among them probably the most famous, La Descrizioni in Atto, collection of poems from uh, 1963 to 1969. They sold 5,000 copies, uh, th this specific one, over the years. The most uh, uh, important thing for me is that they were strictly mimeographed as a statement against the overcoming commercial publishing sector which was both monopolizing the poetry production and becoming the secret dream of alternative artists' groups. The works he produced were meant to be mimeographed and only mimeographed. They would have remained in this status and absolutely not being published differently, following the author's explicit will. With a strict and perfect consistency, they have been producing thousands of copies over time, in different editions still he died, actually, in their exclusive form in which they are still available. Significantly, they have not even been digitized yet. Roversi was printing and assembling copies to those who required these works, directly to him. shipping them at nominal prices, but connecting directly to his audience. Furthermore, he allowed the use of his own mimeograph to students during the 1968 movement, sharing such a strategic production mean. At the end of the 60s, we have a prolific production of mimeographic literary magazines in Italy. As I've learned, it was quite all over the place almost especially allowing the expression of the new concrete and visual poetry production. The mimeograph is enabling them to produce a different type of publishing, what I tentatively try to define as peripheral publishing at that time, which is allowing the new forms of literature to emerge and sprout in the cracks of the monopoly of commercial publishing. 
There are a few acknowledged examples of, this form, of these forms of peripheral publishing. One, is, one of the first magazines of this kind is Geiger, founded by Adriano Spato in Turin in 1968. It was literally uh, giving voice to the uh, rising uh, community of visual and concrete uh, poets uh, in Italy. And it was born just after a festival of poetry and performance called Fiumalbo Parole. It was produced for almost a decade in annual anthological issues. Not too far away in Florence, the visual poet Eugenio Micini founded one of the most respected artist collectives, the Gruppo 70, which had a center for its multiple activities. They were doing not only poetry and publishing, but also theater and uh, the, the, the historical experimental theater magazine Criminali uh, started exactly there. And plenty of other uh, different experiments and initiatives. And in 1969, they started the magazine Techné, which was produced in seven volumes, all formed by an assembling of around 60 loose contributions by various artists with a painstaking care. It was one of the most remarkable examples of the assemblies publications made through the assemblage of material producing a defined number of copies by the different contributors directly. Micini perfectly understood the potential of the medium and affirmed it was the time of the mimeograph. There, in that badly printed sheet, we knew there was something new. And this new could escape the tools and techniques of power to whom belonged the usual. There is an unwritten history of the creative, political, and especially social use of the mimeograph in Italian alternative literature in the 60s and 70s. But its use was lasting longer than that, as probably everywhere else. Still in 1981, for example, the psychologically challenged Alda Merini, one of the greatest Italian poets, during one of her darkest moments, was helped by her friends to publish a new volume through a mimeograph, simply called Poems. This volume actually helped her to regain confidence and approach new publishers before gaining well-deserved fame in the 90s, just a decade before dying, unfortunately. And finally, to perfectly synthesize the intertwining between literature and politics, we should notice that Italo Calvino was mentioning in his famous If on a Winter's Night a Traveler experimental novel, published in 1981, a specific episode. He describes a banned book called Around an Empty Grave, written by Calixto Bandera, which the police has entirely pulped, but an Hyrcanian translation is circulating secretly as a mimeographed edition. Then, to conclude, let's see how I, again, humbly think that we have a mimeograph lesson that can be learned in our current era of post-digital. Let, let me briefly define post-digital, uh, because it's a quite discussed term. There are plenty of them. There's uh, post-internet uh, uh, and quite a few other ones. OK, if we agree on, uh, to, to agree on a definition of post-digital, it's just the current condition where we don't even more notice what is digital and what is not. But we just take for granted it's a complete integration in our life and operations. What is mostly important is that we don't actually question the digital modus operandi, regardless of its nature, if it's technical or industrial. So 
let's assume that the mimeograph instead implemented a specific connective publishing dynamic. And it is important to compare it to the current infinite screen-based publishing. Screen-based publishing is intimate, in my opinion, as it reaches the space of personal screens, often in intimate spaces. But it establishes a remote intimacy, as the publisher is not necessarily meant to be present on the other side, and his or her body is certainly distant and invisible. Furthermore, the publication is a kind of a instant publication on screen-based media, as it, is in most, as it is in its most basic forms, like a post on social media, it's an instant publication. It requires almost no time in preparation. It instantly arrives from the author, who is also a publisher, to the reader. And we instinctively trust it as being produced by an alleged human author. I'm not elaborating more on bots, because that require, would require another whole uh, text. But these forms are different from the very concept of publishing, mostly because they exploit trust and presence. The nature of publishing, etymologically, is to make it public. This is the Italian definition at the bottom. You see, it comes from Latin publicare, which is derived from publicus, which means public. Which means to expose and distribute a publication. With the instant publishing, there's mostly an act of spreading, especially obsessed by the quality of making it popular. With all these processes, mostly automated by the respective platforms, the network becomes merely infrastructural, and the relationship between the author publisher and the reader is mostly functional. In the physical publishing and distributing instead, the audience has to be present and consensual. If we take the physical gesture of handling publications, we can see how there is an opportunity to connect the author and the reader in an open-ended fashion. It includes acknowledgement, further elaboration, and also confront and refuse sometimes. Can I, I mean, I still remember when I was distributing leaflets in the university movement of the 19th, that most of the time, the, 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 the time was spent in confrontation with somebody that was thinking in completely different ways. But that was a shared and trusted space that was really worth spending the time there. All is done in person. So assuming full responsibility of the gestures and opinions. And it is present with the largest possible bandwidth of communication enabled. We communicate when it, there's a physical presence with gestural, vocal, postural, and printed ways too. The printed part is connective and it enables all the rest. These differences can be enhanced, taking into consideration the case of a recent event which involved a large number of people quite intimately on both digital and physical level. I'm referring on this specific, uh, sorry. On this specific episode, on November 28th, 2018, 50,000 printers have been forced to print, uh, uh, printers connected to internet, uh, have been forced uh, to print a text uh, mostly composed with ASCII graphics, as you can see. The text was arriving from a Twitter user using the pseudonym of the hacker giraffe and was telling people, actually inviting them, to subscribe to PewDiePie's 
YouTube channel. If you are not familiar, as I did with PewDiePie, he's a Swedish YouTuber. He's a comedian and video game player commentator on YouTube. So basically, it was advertisement played in a quite uh, 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 low tech way. But the act obviously provoked various kinds of reaction, from rage of having our personal printed invaded by an external communication, to amusement to receive something in such an original, un uh, unusual way. But basically, this is not communication. This was a broadcast. A broadcast which unusually implied a physically forced materialization. The alleged hacker, and here I have a big problem using the word hacker, because the true meaning and the original meaning of word hacker is something completely different than someone who breaks into system and force system to invade other people's privacy and machines. Understood that the, he anyway understood the higher level of attention generated by an expected printout. And he thought that the trust would come along as it usually does in social media. But it didn't. Quite the opposite. Luckily, the unacknowledged exchange of meanings in an intimate space is still generating a reaction. One of the main lessons, then, that we can learn from the mimeograph is that creating a social <coughs> and physical space of exchange where trust is negotiated and possibly agreed and when this happens, it generates a genuine connective type of communication, which we are vastly lacking at the moment, despite our extensive reliance on a different type of networks, which are the IT networks, of course. So for the 21st century publishing, the mimeograph is mostly an archaeological luxury, but it still can teach fundamental values. It tells us how publishing as a practice heavily depends on trust in general and the kind of space it creates. And it finally, oh, sorry, a bit behind. And it finally remarks the importance of creating manageable trust networks where human entities are the key nodes and agents at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alessandro, for being here. And uh, I have to say that I am quite uh, surprised with the extensive research you've done about our subject. Uh, this is very special for us. I thought that you were going to talk about more like the general context. Uh, so thank you so much for all the conceptualizations. You have uh, summarized a lot of what we have been saying here since yesterday. Uh, the references also to uh, Italian practitioners and artists and uh, thinkers uh, resonate very much with uh, Adorno and other people we have mentioned here today. So it's very interesting to see uh, the Italian experience in a nutshell too, represented by uh, Alessandro. So uh, we can take some questions. Any questions or comments? Thank you, that was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, I was really struck by something you said about the imperfection of, of, of printing with a mimeograph. Or I think what you were saying is not that you find it imperfect and aesthetically displeasing, but you find it aesthetically pleasing because it's not uniform. And it reminded me, I was trying to think of the essay, it's a Roland Bart essay, and it's where he talks about the signature of a voice, the grain of a voice. And it really reminded me of that, the idea there's the perfect singer, somebody who's technically perfect, but there's another singer, this is a long, I haven't read this for 20 years, so, so 
this is a kind of a, a, a pricey of it, but there's a moment where he says that the other singer, you can, you can hear the kind of the physicality of their singing. And it really reminded me of that, and it's a really important reminder. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more about that aesthetic of imperfection that you seem to be gesturing towards. Yeah, you were mentioning the aesthetic of failure, actually, just a little note to the very first person of talking about post-digital is a musician, Kim Cascone, in, in, in an essay which is called The Aesthetic of Failure, and it's about the, the, uh, the, the, the f how the failure of machine uh, can lead to our appreciation. So it perfectly, it, it seems that uh, uh, we can enable a dialogue on it. But by the way, uh, to, to trying to, to answer directly the question, um, when we use machines, we, we have to establish a relationship. And if we go straight back to uh, Gutenberg, uh, sorry if I j just mention it, but I think it's particularly uh, c contextual here. Uh, Gutenberg is making actually a, a, a seizure, a, a, an interruption in history between the way that content was uh, produced because for the first time in history, we can have multiple copies perfectly the same. I mean, historically, there has been an outrage of people who were, uh, I mean, the amanuensi, the ones who were coping, it, the copiers. Uh, and uh, what is lost in the mechanical reproduction, in the perfect mechanical reproduction, is the difference between copies that we can notice. So, we associate, I think, the exact reproduction with the driest concept of a machine. So it's something mechanical, something we can't relate to. Useful, but completely unrelated. The perfect voice, as you were mentioning. The very moment we find faults and running a magazine, I really know what it is about. We still have a small department in correction, in ap apologizing for what has been uh, wrong in the previous issue, then you recognize instead the human entity behind it, or more, more than the human, the natural part of it. So that, and this nature part is that something changes. So that means that there's, a, that it is not an automatic reproduction. We, we are really, we are not familiar with the automatic concept because for us it's something that goes beyond our own scope. We can't do things forever, a machine potentially can. And we don't recognize it as something we can relate to. So I think it's in this relationship between human and machine that relies uh, this, uh, this almost instinctual uh, uh, recognition of an aesthetic. And that's why the ink blots, the, the, the differences in the mimeograph, which again, they, they describe this continuity. It's a continuous thing, because these errors never stop. You have to uh, maintain it, you have to clean it. And it's the last one, because with the photocopier, th th this, let's say, faulty characteristic, it's reduced drastically. And with digital, it just doesn't exist, because it's exactly almost uh, I mean, technically, almost, but almost exactly the same sequence we can be replicated infinitely. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Uh, uh, sort of formal reading of these works. That's what interests me about this shift um, at the time, the 60s, was that it was. Uh, there's always an attempt to read it back formally because we're interested in these appearances of difference in quality. But, but also very interesting is that, that there was an objection to formalism at that time, which was often the reason why they were done, to escape from this idea of the single work, you know, to create an open work that could be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And so, although I'm interested in that idea of looking at them formally, I think you have to always remember to mention that, that the impetus quite often was a sort of objection of formalism. 
uh, towards an idea of contextualism. So there's more of a connection to the post-digital works than... I think that connection is really important still, that possibility. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. To me, absolutely. And... Uh, um yeah, so on the aesthetics, we, we can go in, in very different, uh, uh, we can take very different paths. On one side, for example, we probably still have this fascination by the contemporary art world about the so-called new analog as a formalism that is uh, fascinating because it's still a machine but looks old and uh, uh, fr from uh, uh, an, an art market point of view, it, it, it's uh, quite uh, uh, valuable. But uh, most of the time, and that's my problem, personal problem with this kind of artworks, uh, the characteristics of the medium are completely unexploited. So the formalism becomes just, uh, 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 how can I say, an object in a vitrine. Um, uh, I think that... Uh, um, one of the most uh, powerful uh, uh, outcome from the 60s is to, uh, let's say, break this um, uh, useless uh, uh, fear or res to, to um, how can I say, a kind of respect that it was towards the medium and uh, start to um, uh, freely use them for any possible purpose. And, and for me, this is the, 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 the transition between considering medium as means of production to considering media as systems. And once you consider them as systems, then it's a whole system, and you are the, the kid playing within it, and you can have plenty of possible outcomes which has been a, a, a very strong spirit. I mean, it comes together with uh, conceptual art and various other streams uh, back then. Uh, and w what is intriguing for me is that we have experienced something similar with the first wave of internet in the early 90s, uh, in terms that there was a new system that could have been uh, explored, and it has been uh, in small pockets. Uh, so now we have extremely powerful and complex systems that would allow incredible experimentations, but paradoxically enough, we are instead stuck on the corporate industrial level and just slightly playing with them. Not even going beyond the, the um, uh, let's say, uh, industrial dimension. I mean, if you think for a moment about the vocal assistants, uh, that's one of the most disturbing examples for me. What is the system behind them? It's actually quite disturbing. But th they sell a lot, people are playing with them, there's no thinking about what kind of systems I'm dealing with, which we would have learned since the 60s. And I mean, also people who were back then and who have done experiments, now they are playing with the vocal assistants. And it's something to think about. So yeah, the, the formalism uh, should, uh, should be transcended a bit in order to understand uh, in, in the whole complexity around it and overcome it a bit in order to play with this system. One last question, comment? No? Okay. Thanks again, Alessandro. Thank you very much. Thank you.